Hello, horror harlots, and welcome to a brand new episode of Listen With The Lights Off, a radio horror show. This audio lullaby for Friends of the Dark is brought to you by So Say We All and La Jolla Playhouse. I'm your host, Jennifer D. Corley, and I hope you're doing well. Me? I'd be so much better if you smashed our subscribe button like it was the face of that old lady who holds up the bank queue by updating the teller on the state of her bowel movements. We're going to indulge some other gory fantasies today with a story called The Gourd. This episode brings you a tale of vegetal vulgarity from the mind of author Jim Ruland, and his tale was first published by So Say We All in our Black Candies horror anthology, See Through. Now sit back, relax, and try not to have nightmares about those big zucchinis in your refrigerators. The Gourd by Jim Ruland. When Trevor got clean, he lost most of his friends. The worst of those he had left was a mobile phone salesman named Dallas, whose fiance owned a house high up on a hill in Echo Park. Trevor couldn't say whether Dallas, a desperate philanderer and hopeless drunk, actually intended to marry Deborah. But whenever the couple went away together, Trevor watered their garden. Trevor did this for the simple reason that Dallas was his last link to the bad old days, which he felt obligated to hang on like a shoebox filled with old postcards. The last time Trevor was roped into watering the garden, Dallas invited him over for dinner, and they all went through the charade of pretending to enjoy each other's company. Deborah clearly didn't think Trevor's sobriety would stick. He hadn't helped his case by bringing over a bottle of Lithuanian liquor that had been given to him by a co-worker as a gag. Apparently, not even the Lithuanians drink the stuff. At the end of the evening, after Dallas had consumed most of the bottle and promptly puked it back up onto his dinner jacket, he slurred, My vomit? It smells like Christmas trees. If Deborah thought she could have gotten away with it, she would have murdered them both on the spot. To be fair... Deborah hated anyone capable of leading her wayward beau astray, which was everyone. This time, when Dallas called to ask Trevor to water the garden, he lingered on the phone as if there was something more he wanted to ask Trevor and just didn't know how. What's on your mind, Dallas? It's the zucchini. Zucchini? Summer squash. Grows on the ground like a pumpkin. I know what a zucchini is. Well, there was this one time when I trampled Deborah's zucchini that she'd planted without telling me about it. She acted like I stomped on it intentionally. Did you? Maybe. Probably. I don't know. She got what she wanted out of it. Which was? More zucchini. And a sprinkler system. Expensive as fuck. Then what do you need me for? To come over twice a day and make sure the system is online. That's it? But one more thing. Squash grows insanely fast. They start out as flowers, then these little nubs form. Those are the ovaries. Next thing you know, you got a garden full of sex toys. Sounds freaky. We got this one plant that grows a super humongous zucchini that Deb's kind of fixated on. Obsessed, really. But you didn't hear that from me. How, how big? I don't know. Haven't measured it lately. But it's pretty fucking big. Prune it. Talk to it. Give it a little TLC. You want me to talk to your zucchini? You need to keep that sucker alive, Trevor. Because if you don't, I don't know what'll happen to me and Deborah. Because of a zucchini? Well, also because of the tomatoes. And the Mercedes. But what I'm saying is I'm counting on you. Have I ever let you down since I got clean and sober, I mean? No. Do you have any friends more reliable than me? You're my only friend. What do you want me to do... With the rest of the zucchini. I don't care. Make some zucchini bread. Have a party. When Trevor was a kid, his grandmother used to bake zucchini bread. She'd get up early and start baking while the house was still cool. It was the first thing he'd smell when he woke up. Rich, 
sweet, earthy. It was maybe his favorite childhood memory. Where are you going, by the way? Couples retreat. In Paris. Paris? I didn't know you could speak French. I don't. That's the best part. The evening of Dallas's departure, Trevor drove to Echo Park. He planned his trip to coincide with the post-rush hour pre-sunset window, when the palms that lined the streets were dappled with orange light. Young professional types walked their indoor dogs, older women took post-yoga strolls up and down the asphalt slopes, and fertile men smoked on the sidewalks while scrolling through their phones. Trevor was able to take in all these details because there was no place to fucking park. When prowling for a spot, Trevor had something like a flashback. He'd been here before. Back in his grandma day days. Back when the nights went by in a flash and the mornings never ended. When the night wound down for the other revelers, Trevor would go back to his dealer, pick up another gram, and keep on rolling. The dealers he frequented always seemed to live in nice houses in the hills. And one of the many that Trevor had cultivated lived somewhere around here. These days, Echo Park had more cars than spots, and Trevor ended up leaving his vehicle in the parking lot of an auto parts store down on the boulevard. He trudged up the hill, setting off a chorus of barking dogs with each house he passed. Stapled to the telephone pole in front of Deborah's house was a pair of lost pet notices, one above the other. Trevor punched in the code, and when the buzzer sounded, he pulled open the gate and went up the short cement steps to a second gate that required a second code, which was the inverse of the first, and finally gave him access to the garden. The layout had changed since his last visit, presumably on account of the newly installed sprinkler system. The majority of the garden consisted of desert succulents and drought-friendly species of lavender, rosemary, and sage, White sage, grandmother sage, thunderclap sage, you name it, sage. The plants that required more frequent watering were lined up along the perimeter of the fence. Deborah had the basil, kale, and other herbs and lettuces on one side and the zucchini on the other. Trevor followed the flagstone walk through the hardy succulents and approached the zucchini plants with apprehension. At first glance, he didn't see what all the fuss was about. The plants were big, but not grotesquely so. Just your garden variety zucchini. Their dusky leaves in stark contrast with the white gravel. Trevor stooped to get a closer look at the plants and was assaulted by the scent of the nutrient-rich soil that Dallas had complained cost as much per pound as he paid per ounce of the high-strained marijuana that he used to mitigate his hangovers. It was not a pleasant smell, but an odor as persistent and pervasive as pond stink. This brought back memories, too. He peered through the foliage, but all he could see were long, dark, crook-necked gourds, undeniably phallic, sprawled in the shadows like drunks. Many of them were topped with spent flowers that resembled used condoms rotting in the dark. He selected a zucchini and ripped it free, the stiff nettle stinging his hands. He tossed it in a basket and moved down the row. The monster zucchini resided in the corner where the two rows of planters came together. It was considerably larger and darker than the rest, and its forest green leaves possessed a purplish tint. Trevor parted the plant's leaves with his hands and spied a squash so big he couldn't see the whole thing, just the portion that pushed through the leaves and twinkled in the fading sunlight like an eye. Although it proved to be just the bulb at the bottom of the plant, Trevor had the distinct impression it was peering back at him. Hi, my name is Trevor, and I will be your caretaker for the next week or so. I am looking forward to this opportunity for you and I to, um, uh, wow, this is, this is so dumb. Talking to a vegetable or fruiting ovary or whatever the hell this is. A whirring sound that Trevor couldn't identify. Helicopter? Leaf blower? distracted him from his conversation, one-sided though it was. He scanned the skies and saw nothing, but the sound intensified until he recognized, too late, what it was. Sprinkler heads rose out of the gravel like submerged sentinels, guardians of the garden, 
and unleashed a blast of water that sent Trevor scurrying back to his car. When Trevor was a boy, he lived in a subdivision that had been built next to a reclaimed garbage dump. Over a period of years, the dump was converted into a massive, multi-use grass-covered slope with an astounding variety of skull-cracking skate parks and playgrounds called Vista View, but everyone called it Mount Scum. Mount Scum was overrun with Baptist Boy Scouts that Trevor did his best to avoid, preferring instead to haunt the diseased pond on the backside of the old dump. The pond smelled weird and was prone to fish kills and was good for at least one dead dog per summer. It was even rumored that a kid had drowned there, but the details were sketchy. The pond was not nearly as large as a lake, yet sizable enough to have its own tiny island, which was uninhabited and possessed a thicket of cattails around its greasy shores. Trevor spent a great deal of time wondering what went on there, how it came into being. Had it been shaped by the same hands that made a mountain out of trash? Was it possible that no human foot had ever set sneaker there? Did such places exist anymore? Did it even have a name? Trevor was desperate to explore the island, but two things held him back. His father's direct order, You stay the fuck away from that pond! And the astounding ickiness of the pond surface, which was thick with iridescent scum that gleamed in the early morning sunlight, like the carapace of an exotic beetle. He considered building a boat, but that would require the kind of effort that would have made Trevor no different than those Baptist assholes who congregated atop Mount Scum on Saturday mornings, flying homemade kites and building cars for the annual soapbox derby. Fuck that. I'm exploring this island commando style. One cool morning toward the end of summer vacation, equipped with an aluminum pole purloined from his father's tent, a canvas satchel left over from his days as a newspaper delivery boy, and a mason jar with holes punched in its lid that had once held innumerable grasshoppers, praying mantises, and lightning bugs, all deceased. Trevor entered the muck. The water was colder than he thought it would be, pleasingly so and less deep than he'd imagined, and his wobbly, tentative steps gave way to bold, discoverer-type strides. Soon the water went over his knees, crept up his thighs, and tickled his nutsack. The next step plunged him waist-deep, and the step after that went up to his armpit. He was prepared to go in up to his neck, no farther, but could already feel the bottom rising under his feet. He was going to make it. The pole was a big help, a steadying influence. Stroke a freaking genius, really. He took his eyes off the pink and purple islets of scum and scoured the beach for a place where he would plant his flag, so to speak, on the virgin land beyond the cattails. And it was at this moment that the muck gave away beneath his feet, completely submerging him. Trevor screamed as he went under, swallowing who knows how many liters of reclaimed garbage water and how many millions of microscopic muck dwellers. He thrashed about, losing his pole. Most terrifying of all was the silty slurb of mud that spilled into the hole and sealed around his foot like a cement boot. Somehow he was able to right himself, regain his footing, and blorped his way out of the scum hole, sacrificing a sneaker in the process. Trevor scrambled up the bank, crashed through the cattails, and arrived on solid ground. The clearing in the center of the island was ringed with cattails in every direction. There was nowhere else to go. He'd made it. There. Trevor found not virgin soil, but a filthy mattress, stained and redolent with rot. As disappointed as he was, there were still spoils to be reaped. Tucked under a corner of the mattress was a plastic bag that contained a wrinkled, musty-smelling pornographic magazine that displayed an alluring, yet confusing, array of genitalia that made Trevor forget all about the tentpole he'd lost in the pond and focus on the one thrusting out of his shorts. Wowzers. This warranted further study, and he stuffed the magazine in his satchel. 
The other discovery Trevor made on the leeward side of the Isle of Porn, as he would come to think of it many years later, was a shallow puddle teeming with tadpoles that were strikingly similar to the swimmers he'd only just learned about in his beginnings of biology class. Trevor filled his specimen jar with the little wrigglers, hoisted his spoils above his head, and returned home. On his way back, Trevor considered the possibility that he had swallowed a tadpole during his plunge in the pond. If he had indeed swallowed a tadpole, was it possible for it to grow inside of him? To lengthen and sprout legs? Legs that could attach themselves to his innards? Or even scamper around, feeding off the food he ate until the frog was as big and strong as the bulbous, croaking creatures that plopped about the muck like lords? Trevor had no idea. While his dad was heating up the hamburger casserole that his grandmother had made the previous weekend, Trevor asked. What would happen if I swallowed a... He didn't say tadpole, because even going near the pond was a groundable offense. A live and squiggly thing. What? Like a tiny fish but not a fish. Like a worm? Yeah, except not a little swimmer. What the hell are you talking about, kid? Um, never mind. That night, Trevor went to bed early, turned off the lamp and clicked on his flashlight. He flipped through the pages of the magazine to the spread that enraptured him most. Photos of a man putting a penis in his mouth. In some of the pictures, the man gazed at the penis like it was a holy object. Like there was a tractor beam between the penis and the mouth. And then, on the next page, good lord. The expression on the face of the man with the penis in his mouth was nothing compared to the expression of the man whose penis was doing the mouth stuffing. His expression suggested the experience was marvelous beyond words, and though Trevor would prefer to have seen Mindy, his beginnings of biology lab partner, having her mouth stuffed, it's not like a mouth was a boy part or a girl part. It was a people part. So what exactly was he feeling down there? What did it all mean? What did it all mean? Later, but apparently not late enough, Trevor discovered he was able to recreate the sensation he'd felt on the island, a sensation that he enhanced with touching and tugging and jerking, which created a spasmodic eruption of pleasure the likes of which Trevor had never experienced before. His leg twitched, and his right foot struck the table upon which the specimen jar sat. The tadpole spilled across the bedroom floor, creating a mess Trevor ignored while he pondered what to do with the hot jizz that had splashed onto his belly, a mess he hadn't been the least bit prepared for. And that's how his father found him when he opened the bedroom door and snapped on the lights. His naked son sprawled on the bed with a gay porno magazine spread open, the odor of semen mixing with the stench of stagnant pond water, and dying tadpoles gasping for breath with gills that they didn't even have. Little swimmers would swim no more. His dad didn't say a word. He simply backed out of the room and shut the door. They never spoke of it again. The morning after Dallas's departure for Paris, Trevor met the next-door neighbor, He was entering the code for the exterior gate, thinking about what he was going to say to the zucchini when she came running down the hill, wearing short shorts and a tank top at least two sizes too small. Trevor couldn't tell if she was in her late 20s or early 30s, but her physique was impressive. Excuse me? Excuse me. Are you the new house sitter? Technically, he wasn't. He didn't even have keys to the house although the question raised more questions. New? Had there been another? As far as Trevor was concerned, there was only one thing to say to a woman in distress. Yes. I need your help. 
and I don't know who else to turn to. What's the matter? I've lost my fiefums. Your what? My cat. I've looked all over and I think he might be in your yard. Would it be okay if I came up for a few seconds and called for him? Sometimes he gets scared and hides and if he's not familiar with his surroundings, he'll just stay there. It'll only take 15 seconds, I swear. Sure. Trevor said this because this was a theme that had launched a thousand pornos. Thank you so, so much. Trevor opened the first gate, then the second, and stood by and watched Dallas's neighbor call for her cat for considerably longer than 15 seconds. They ended up in the corner where the giant zucchini lurked under the cover of its spade-shaped leaves, leaves that appeared a tad lighter than they had the day before. Oh, beefums, the neighbor cried, and Trevor expected the cat to come crawling out from under the leaves, but instead... The neighbor collapsed on Trevor's shoulder. I don't know what I'm going to do. He's my only boy. Although this made no sense to Trevor, he was moved by the intensity of her feelings. It had been a while since Trevor had felt this way about anything. I'll keep an eye out for him. Trevor put his arms around her, feeling simultaneously aroused and ashamed of that arousal. Why did the two always have to go hand in hand? I know you will. Trevor imagined he could feel the gourd judging him silently from the shadows. Trevor paced his bungalow apartment, unable to sleep. He'd cleaned his tiny studio. He was a compulsive neatnik until it was spick and span, but he couldn't stop thinking about the gourd. All kinds of thoughts went through his head. Things he'd said to the zucchini during his last visit. Things he'd meant to say but had forgotten. Things that still needed to be said. He was considering turning on his laptop and composing his thoughts when Dallas called. There was a lot of noise on the other end of the line. Just checking in on the Sasquatch. Sas- Sasquatch? Sasquatch, el gordo, the great zucchini. Uh, right, right, yeah. Everything's fine. Uh, where are you? Swingers party. Don't get excited. There's some real woofers here. Some of these chicks are hairier than you. I, I met your neighbor. Carol? Crazy eyes, but total smoke show. Yeah, yeah, that would be her. Did she try to blow you? What? No, no. I, I helped her look for her cat. I bet you did. How's Paris? Paris blows. You wouldn't believe how snooty these assholes are. But tell me something, T. When you said you helped Carol look for her cat, I hope you didn't let her in the garden. No. I'm going to break it down for you, Trevor. If Deborah found out you let that psycho anywhere near her zucchini, she'd have a shit fit like you wouldn't believe. I'd go so far as to say I don't think it's something our friendship could survive. Well, we can't have that. I'm super supremo serious about this, dude. Serious as cancer. Stage four cancer with the side of AIDS. Serious. You hearing me? I'm hearing you, but why? Uh, Oh, shit. Deborah needs more lube. Ciao! Trevor went back to the garden at dawn. Even early in the morning, there was nowhere to park, so he left his car in his usual spot at the auto parts parking lot. Walking up the hill, he noticed more signs for lost pets. A Pomeranian and a Calico had joined the ranks of the disappeared. He entered the codes and went up to the garden. He checked the sprinkler system to make sure it was working. A series of three green lights, two solid and one blinking, told him that everything was as it should be. And he made his way to the zucchini. Hi, Gord. It's me, Trevor. As he entered the garden's gloom, he could see that something was wrong. Its once dark and lustrous leaves were now ashy and mottled with fungus. Sasquatch appeared to be in some kind of distress. While the gourd seemed to have grown substantially, its color had faded so that it more closely resembled a watermelon, though quadruple the size. It seemed to Trevor that the leaves shimmied as he stooped to inspect the plant. 
More zucchinis had begun to sprout along the vine, but he didn't see how this could cause the plant's leaves to whiten. Trevor went about plucking off the nubs, but they were tough and the nettles sharp. Jerking them free required considerable violence and no small degree of resolve. As if it didn't want to give up its offspring, he gave the last nub a final twist. <coughs> Trevor stopped. The garden went still. Was the gourd talking back to him? Or was there something else in the garden? Fifums, is that you? In the distance, a large vehicle rumbled and clanked, garbage truck engaging in intercourse with its bins. After enough time had passed to convince Trevor that he'd imagined the sound, he got up and washed his scratched, dirty hands with the garden hose. He walked down the hill to the parking lot, vaguely wondering if he ought to go back and take a few photos of the plant to send to Dallas. He found himself standing in the lot, staring dumbly at the spot where he thought he'd parked his car, trying to remember if he'd left it somewhere else. His thought these days were filled with gourds, and as the gourds in the garden grew, they crowded out everything else. Senor. An old brown-skinned man pushed a shopping cart his way. He wore a faded work shirt and a cowboy hat whose brim was hopelessly sweat-stained. They towed your truck. They come at sunrise like vultures. <sighs> Muchos gracias. He was having trouble coming to terms with the fact that his car was really gone. De nada. The old man replied with a smile that revealed a silver tooth gleaming in the morning light. You look like a man who works the earth. Is that right? It is. Mm, I have something for you. The man dug through his cart until he found what he was looking for. An old oil cloth that he unfolded to reveal a fearsome-looking machete. Sharp steel. Hmm? Good price. Uh, no. No, thank you. An uncharitable thought flashed through Trevor's head. Was this man hacking up the neighborhood pets with his machete? How about these work gloves? Worn, but sturdy. How much? Five dollars. I'll take them. While Trevor withdrew his wallet and extracted a five dollar bill, the man smiled, showing even more silver. The man pulled out his smartphone and began tapping in numbers. Let me call the tow truck company for you. On the drive over back to the garden that evening, it occurred to him that he could talk to the zucchini the way he would talk to Dallas. Unlike his friend, the gourd wouldn't crack jokes or cut him off or treat him like an idiot. He could treat the zucchini as a stand-in for people he had trouble talking to, like Dallas or his dad, like everyone. As he approached the gate, he saw Carol. She stood in between an elder woman with sleek, dark hair and a young man in mattress shorts and leather sandals. They all had their phones out and were primed for action. There he is! Trevor had spent most of the afternoon chasing down the driver who'd towed his car to find out which of the company's several yards his vehicle had been taken to. He was in no mood for the pet people of Echo Park. We think our pets are in your yard and we want to have a look. Didn't we go through this yesterday? Under the circumstances, we think a more exhaustive search is in order. What circumstances would that be? A half a dozen pets have gone missing all in this neighborhood. Three more went missing this week, including... Including Beefums. I was here this morning. There are no pets here. Still, we'd like to have a look. If you could let us in to document the scene. I'm afraid I can't allow that. Trevor pulled on his work gloves. Now excuse me, I have work to do. Shielding the keypad so that the neighbors couldn't see the sequence of numbers, he found that he had to remove his gloves to punch in the code. That done, he slipped inside and pulled the gate shut with more violence than he intended, resulting in a nerve-jangling clang that startled him. Carol threw herself against the gate. Trevor was so alarmed by her wild accusations, her wanton display of... 
Yes, he hated to admit it, but Dallas had been right. Psychosis. He fled and had to input the code for the second gate several times before he mastered the sequence. <sighs> El Gordo had grown considerably during Trevor's absence. The leaves that once shrouded the squash in vegetal gloom were no longer large enough to shade the gourd and were white and brittle with decay, exposing the swollen squash in a way that seemed almost indecent. The zucchini was growing so fast that its color was now several shades lighter, like the unripened rind of a melon mixed with the pearly translucence of a creature that made its home beneath the sea. What's the matter, big guy? Are you thirsty? Are you getting enough water? Tell me what's wrong. Did the cat lady upset you? It's okay. She upsets me too. Trevor searched the plant for new growths, and the few he found he twisted off with the new force that the gloves allowed. The giant gourd, now the size of a coffee table, seemed to shift, as if to recoil from his aggression. What's this? Have you been hiding something from me? Trevor spied a zucchini he hadn't noticed before. It was eight inches long and grew from the offshoot pinned underneath the massive monster. Trevor wedged his body between the fence and the ground and tried to grasp the growth, but couldn't quite reach it. He inched forward, took hold of the zucchini, and snapped it off. The gourd shuddered and rolled, pinning Trevor to the fence. The zucchini he plucked must have served as a kind of wedge, and the gourd had shifted as he pulled it free. But now the gourd kept pressing, like it wanted to smother him in the dirt or flatten him against the fence. With his face pressed against its rough and warty flesh, Trevor could hear something gurgling inside the gourd. A muffled cry as it pressed harder and harder. Is this really happening? Trevor thought as he shifted his weight and tried to push back. He didn't have much success. If anything, he lost more ground to the gourd. But he was able to work his arm free and strike the great zucchini with his fist. For a split second, the pressure relented and Trevor slipped free. The gourd crashed into the fence, splintering some of the boards and cracking the post. Trevor scrambled across the gravel, crushing who knows how many succulents, and waited by the hose until his breathing slowed and his mind stopped racing. He needed to talk to Dallas and find out what the hell was going on. He hauled out his phone and dialed the number. While the phone rang and rang, he tried to think of something coherent to say, but none of this made sense. Zucchinis don't move, and they sure as hell don't scream. They also weren't supposed to grow to the size of a living room furniture, so what the fuck? When he reached Dallas's voicemail, Trevor panted into the phone. It's not right. It's an abomination. It's, it's evil. At home, Trevor brewed a pot of calming tea that his sponsor had given him early in his sobriety. He'd claimed the tea possessed an extract used by ancient Mayans that allowed the imbiber to see clearly, to perceive things as they really are. It was bullshit, but Trevor drank the tea. The gourd was past the point of becoming a problem. It was a full-on threat to his safety, a menace. With the clarity of an after-school special, Trevor could see he'd been wrong and Carol had been right. She wasn't crazy. A little overly attached to her pet, perhaps, but clearly not insane. She knew there was something wrong with Deborah's garden. But did Deborah? Was this whole gourd sitting business an elaborate setup to lure him? A man with few emotional attachments someone nobody would miss. 
to her garden where he'd end up as fertilizer for that swollen monstrosity? He wasn't concerned with what this said about Deborah and Dallas. Fuck them. But what did it say about him? This was what he'd gotten clean for? Fuck. Trevor emptied the pot and washed the cup. And when he was done, he dried them and put them back in the cabinet. He knew what needed to be done. Trevor waited in the auto parts parking lot for the man with the machete. He figured he'd offer $60 cash for the steal. $60 seemed like a fair price to rid the world of evil. He waited for most of the morning, and when the old man finally arrived, he didn't seem surprised to see Trevor. I'd like to buy that machete. Ah, senor, you're too late. I sold the machete yesterday. I wish it had been you because this woman, she scared me a little. Beautiful lady, but crazy in the eyes. Do you know what I mean? I know what you mean. But I have something else for you. Trevor felt something like love for the old man as he fished out a box out of the bottom of the cart and made a great show out of opening it. I think this will help you with your job, senor. I think you're right. Trevor gave the man all the money he had in his wallet. The gourd looked ghostly white in the moonlight. It was now the size of a refrigerator. As Trevor approached, the gourd shuddered and began to emit a terrible high-pitched whine. The same sound he'd heard the day before, only louder. A vegetal scream that Trevor drowned out by firing up his new purchase. chainsaw started on the first pull with a belch of smoke that bathed Trevor in fumes, just as the old man had promised. Trevor crossed the gravel graveyard and straddled Sasquatch. He felt the gourd kick between his thighs as he lowered the teeth of the saw into its flesh. The creature's meat and seed and ichor burst from the body of the gourd, showering Trevor with zook gore. He moved the saw up and down with a precision he didn't know he possessed. His goal was to open the gourd, not smash it. He slid back and continued to cut until the incision was several feet long, like a slot on the back of a giant piggy bank. Dogs howled all over the neighborhood. He kicked the gourd, and when it didn't break, He returned to its center and tried to pry the two halves open. Though silent, Sasquatch hadn't given up the fight and clamped down on Trevor's hands like a jaw. It was weaker now, and little by little Trevor was able to rip the beast open until it gave way with an anguished moan and was rent in two. Inside the gourd, dozens of gelatinous pods of various sizes and shapes wriggled and squirmed, pink and purple pods laced with ropey strings of fibrous biomass, blighted with black spots, bathed in gordy goo. Some were the size of softballs, others as big as beer kegs. The larger ones knocked up against another, while the small shapes spasmed and twitched. They writhed with freakish potency. Trevor got down on his knees and tore the first pod open, and a small cat thrust its head out, mewling like mad. Fiefums? (coughs) 
Trevor tore away the rest of the pod's sticky coat and the cat shook off the remnants of its second birth. Trevor scooped up Fifim's and slid him inside his shirt, then went to work on the rest of the pods, tearing open the egg-like sacks with his hands, unleashing a pack of chihuahuas, a couple of feral cats, several nervous squirrels, and even a pit bull, who showed her thanks by showering Trevor with slobber, as joyful an expression of gratitude as he had experienced in his 30 years on the planet. Soon the yard was filled with yelping, mewling, barking creatures. They shook their bodies to rid themselves of their slumber. Trevor flung open the gates and let the animals escape. They all fled, except for the pit bull, who turned at what was left of the gourd and growled. Good girl. Trevor found the stalk where the gourd was connected to the plant and severed it with the saw. He doused the mess with gasoline from the garage and struck a match. The gourd roasted and burned. When the flames reached the height of the fence, Trevor turned the hose on the vegetable, and the yard filled with dense smoke until all that was left of the gourd was its collapsed rind, sodden in black. Walking up the hill with the cat nestled inside his shirt and the pit bull at his side, Trevor breathed in air that, for the first time in days, wasn't heavy with the stench of something scummy and shameful, but something rich and aromatic, something wonderful. When he reached Carol's yard, he had it. The neighborhood was perfumed with the unmistakable scent of zucchini bread. which I want more after all that. A chainsaw or a trip to Paris? While I think about that, you think about joining us for our future episodes of Listen With The Lights Off, because that's all the time we have for today, friends. Do tune in next time for more uneasy feelings, nagging paranoia, and existential dread. And we don't mean at your therapy session. We mean right here. The Gourd featured Victor Morris as the narrator, Dallas McLaughlin as Trevor, Thomas Morrison as young Trevor, Solomon Maya as Dallas, John Padilla as the old man, Alyssa Ann Austin as Carol, Justin Hudnall as Trevor's dad, Patrick Mayuyu and Yolanda Franklin as the neighbors, and Violet and Lana the cats as fiefums. Listen with the Lights Off is created by So Say We All in partnership with La Jolla Playhouse as part of their digital Without Walls series. All the stories on this show come from So Say We All Press's horror anthologies, Black Candies. Please do buy the books, available through our website, sosayweallonline.com. This episode of Listen With The Lights Off was produced by myself, Jennifer D. Corley, and edited by Justin Hudnall. The Gourd was directed by Melissa Coleman-Reed. At La Jolla Playhouse, Jacole Kitchen is Artistic Programs Manager and Local Casting Director. Mary Cook is Communications Director. Amy Ashton is Producing Associate. Becky Beagleson is Director of Public Relations, Mia Fiorella is Director of Sales and Marketing, and Nancy Showers is Senior Multimedia Director. Our intro theme is by Kurt Conan from AMFM Music. Our outro theme is by Daniel Schreyer, and the scoring and sound effects you hear during the stories performed come from our Foley artist maestro, Scott Paulson. If you'd like to learn more about La Jolla Playhouse, visit lajoyaplayhouse.org, And to keep in the loop with So Say We All, read more about the artists who made this project possible, and become involved as one of our future storytellers, visit sosayweallonline.com or find us on social media. We just don't have an OnlyFans. Yet. Until next time, I'm Jennifer D. Corley, and remember, if you find yourself feeling terrified and alone, there's probably good reason. Now, more than ever.